new for 96 with your hosts Kevin McCauley and Chris Wynn. What are you doing? Are you updating your Zenga? Yeah. Your live journal? Your Angel Fire page? What? The silence says yes. Uh, yeah. No, I get, I'm getting like a thousand global offers for this iPhone that's listed. Is the auction imminent? No, I just put it up tonight, but I keep getting like offers. People like, hey, I see the starting bid's $200. Yeah, you have like 72 hours to answer them. I don't want to answer any of them. I'm annoyed that I'm getting any. Yeah. Well, you can ignore... Wait, why didn't you set like the... Okay, why are we talking about this? <laughs> it's important. <laughs> this is the most pressing issue oh, of the day. <laughs> God. <sighs> Anyways. Hello, Kevin. Uh, so we are recording? Yes. No. Okay. No. The on-air light is just a kitschy thing I got at Spencer's. It was on sale. It glows in the dark. Yeah, it does. It does. Um. Well, welcome to another episode of <laughs> New, New for 96. Ah. <sighs> How you doing, Kevin? Uh, trying to read my email. <laughs> yeah, I know. You literally, you have a laptop on your lap. I where I'd like to find a better place for it. Yep, yep. It's called a laptop. Mm. So, how are you? Uh, I'm doing okay. Good. I'm cold. Mm-hmm. It's currently like literally 30 degrees in Houston right now. I couldn't help but notice that you were shaking like a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> it's pronounced chihuahua. <laughs> Blew that out trying to pronounce that. With my very correct pronunciations. Yes. Um, I I love dogs, and I never thought that I would like chihuahuas, chihuahuas. Um, but I did meet one mm-hmm. and got to know one. My brother and sister-in-law's chihuahua uh, was the most amazing, is the most amazing dog. Like, she is so smart. And so amazing. Like, she acts like a big dog. And maybe that's why I like... I know. Uh, that's why I like her. Um, and so, I have now a fondness for the Chihuahua. <laughs> that's how it's spelled. <laughs> um, anyways, so... Um, what have you been up to, Kevin? I drove in the Lemons race with Steph. Yeah. What about you? <laughs> was that was that your summary of your entire weekend, like racing for twenty four hours straight? Uh, no, I could go into it more. Um, okay, we'll go into it later. We'll go. Yeah, exactly. All right, fine. Yeah. What did what I do we, this weekend? You you ask. You received a beverage. You received a bottle of alcohol. Oh, we should mention. Wait, hang on. Let's grab it here. Since uh, we can't uncork it to make the sound effect, um, we did get a um, nice gift from a fan, uh, Elia, who listens to the podcast. Um, one of three. Yep, one of three people. Uh, and uh, I, I went to the Sid Mashburn Cars and Coffee, Classics and Coffee uh, event on Saturday, this last Saturday, and uh, I brought the Celsius there. And, um, I saw a man standing with a bottle of Japanese whiskey, like near the car, but talking to somebody. And this was at like 9am, right? It was at 9am. So I was like, well, you know, everyone has their priorities. And, um, but I also thought like, well, that is, that's very coincidental that he has like a bottle of Japanese whiskey standing next to, uh, a Japanese domestic market car. And, uh, like later on during the event like he pops over or he walks over to me and he's like this is for you and i thought he was joking at first um but he hands me the bottle and like he was nicest guy uh we chatted for a long time um like he listens to he listens to the podcast and he finds you to be like okay funny (laughs) so um that's amazing that's such a cool experience i wish i could have been there 
I was at the aforementioned lemons race. Yeah. I missed it, but I really enjoyed that event. How did he know that you or one of us would be be there? Did he go last year? And he did mention um, meeting one of us prior. Okay. Um, and I I don't know. Yeah. So I think maybe he brought it along um, in the hopes of running into one or both of us. And that is so cool. Yeah, it was really cool. So um, we'll post a picture on the Instagram. Can you? What is the the bottle? It is Nick, Nika Whiskey Single Malt Yoichi. That is not how any of those words are pronounced. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, this is a it's a lovely bottle of whiskey and we are fans of whiskey here on the podcast and in real life <laughs> um and yeah this is a, a great accompaniment um so we're enjoying this as we record tonight and it's keeping us warm on this 30 degree it day. is it is yeah yeah um anyways so um other interesting things so um so this this car meet up is at this kind of uh, nice men's clothing store. It's kind of um, it's kind of hard to describe. It's just kind of like casual but really nice uh, clothing, like where they would sell like Filson stuff and etc. Mm-hmm. Um, and our friend David Buer always um, caters the coffee from his company, Greenway Coffee Company. And they do this show like twice a year, mm-hmm. like spring and fall. Yeah. For- yeah sort of and and all the the staff is like the nicest people you've ever met and everyone's so cool super nice and, and like it's really chill because they're it's like, all like interesting men like yeah. in- interesting dash men like they're all like knowledgeable about like manly goods um and they're, and they're so welcoming to everyone that attends yeah. or brings a car or yeah. just comes to yeah. look at cars and drink coffee mm-hmm. and stuff and the cars are uh, like they're pretty interesting. Although, like, there are a lot of new Ferraris, which I'm like not as like interested well, I think in a lot seeing. Of those are like brought by, like I think like the dealer or, like send. You know what I mean? I Maybe think some yeah. Of that is, like, but yeah, but there are also like kind of other interesting. Like I mean, it's anyone can bring their car. It's not like a um restricted event by any means. And usually, like yeah, very interesting cars do show up. And I think yeah, the dealers do bring cars as well because it is that kind of like. I, it's in the River Oaks neighborhood of Houston, and so like there's a, a certain demographic. So it's it's an upscale neighborhood uh, in the inner city, uh, so it kind of fits the the aesthetic of everything going on there. Um, but and it's a small parking lot. Small parking so, lot. So I mean, as well. it's probably twenty cars. Yeah, at most, at most. Um, which is which is cool. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's just right. a nice small event, um, and everyone's always enjoyable enjoyable to talk to there yeah. as well. And um, the same Testarossa always gets brought. I've never talked to the owner, um, the one mirrored one. Yeah, the owner and I have messaged on Instagram. Oh, really? Okay. He also has a 964 Turbo Okay. that uh, he brought to the PCA. That's together, cool. But I didn't see him. There was a car there. So there was a car there that um, you and I both saw last week. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a... An ice blue, nine thirty, um, at the PCA meet, and um, it was brought to this meet as well. And we both looked at that car because it's a Turbo Carrera, the seventy six first year, and you know first fourth, year America, first year America, I should say. And um, you know we both looked at it because it, it was a beautiful combination. It was just like really unique, and it had the so unique. And you and you knew it was an early, a super yeah. early one. Yeah, and it had it also had the the, the stripes. It had the stripe graphic. Yeah, on it the, the half the, tone. Yeah, the half tone like turbo. It actually yeah. says turbo uh, along the rear uh, of the car. Um, so I talked to, I you didn't see last week, but. Um, I saw Michael driving off in it. Oh. Um, and uh, sure enough, I saw him again this week with the car. And then he finally told me the story of the car. And I already told Kevin about this, but it's... I'm going to act surprised. Please act surprised anyways, because we didn't know anything about the car until um, this story. But it has apparently... Uh, documentation proving that this was the turbo 
Carrera that was introduced at the New York Auto Show in 1976. Uh, this was the car that introduced the turbo to the United States. That's so cool. It's amazing. And it has like 45,000 miles on it. It's one of those type of cars. And he plans on driving it around personally for about a year. And he has a, uh, he has a, um, would you call it a dealership? It's a sh- collection. It's, uh, yeah, I guess it is a dealership. It's um, like a consignment situation. Yeah, Alera maybe? Garage. Yeah. Uh, and man, super cool cars. You've seen a few of them on Bat before. Um, and they're just like these perfect condition perfect storied cars uh that sell kind of almost along the lines of like avant-garde um Mm -hmm. whenever they post on bring a trailer um but anyways it was just so like he just like walked me around the car and showed it to me and it was just like it just made it all all the more magical just realizing the interior is like bright blue it's a bright it's a blue on blue car it's a light blue on like medium blue medium blue is the best way to describe it and it's so weird to see like uh because we'd seen like turbo carreras before but um i always forget like that they have like the mid-year interiors um where it's like a super clean dash with no vents and then it has like the ac attachment like it has like that old school like if you have a car a vintage car and you want to add ac they like attach vents to like a place in the cabin where like the only place where they can fit it so it's very like retrofitted in a way but anyways but the car is like pristine completely original um and yeah it's just kind of like a neat story yeah. um and I've always, i i, I want to look it up too like i want to see like um it on display at the new york auto show yeah um but so that was kind of cool we have a lot of like neat cars in houston like with like interesting history and it probably comes up here i mean if we're all honest like by way of oil money and other interests but um say for instance like um that link that you sent me to that all white porsche collection yeah we suspect that and if um it was that a new video by the way yeah i think it just went up yesterday i saw it on you it was like recommended for me and i subscribe to the pca yeah youtube but it's on the porsche club of america youtube channel they yeah. got inside this secret all-white porsche collection that is in houston and the thing is that like when you look at it it's not even just like oh it's a bunch of white cars it is like uh it's like everything is it's like a museum of mm-hmm. white cars like it almost looks like an art installation and it is a vast indoor field well lit like a museum of white Porsches, like as far as the eye can see. Mm -hmm. And it's everything from 356s to 959s to like 918s. All the RS cars. Yeah, and it's not just like all turbos. All turbos. There are chiffon whites, Grand Prix. GT2s of every generation that they've offered the GT2. It is immense and if not like a very particular, if not obsessive collection of a particular color, uh, but it's impressive, mm-hmm. like to say the least. And we have like good reason to suspect that, that because it, it's described in the video as an undisclosed location, but like we have it on like probably questionable authority that it is in Houston. <laughs> I did message Jordan. Yeah, and did uh, with he confirm? the link, and he confirmed. Okay, um, so there are people in town. Basically, there are people in town who have either seen it or somehow have confirmed it. But there is a building in Houston, and this is our kind of like um, our own personal evidence of this is that there is a building in Houston. It's a huge <laughs> warehouse, like it spans like two or three blocks. I want to say, and it's gleaming white. It's pristine white. And the address of the building, uh, like, we are people who are sensitive to typography, but it is, it's the Porsche-like typeface. The long, Yeah, uh, the for wide. the numbers. Yeah. yeah, for the numbers. So, I mean, that's just so specific. So, that's our thought. Mm-hmm. We don't have, like, any other, like, first-hand knowledge Uh, I would love to tour the space if perhaps he might be a listener. He might might be. Very unlikely considering who we are. But uh, anyways, um, yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, So that was my weekend. Also, 
one other thing, which, <laughs> so, ooh, that was loud. So I went to um, a wedding this weekend and um, on Saturday, and I received a call in the middle of this wedding, um, and it was a delivery truck. And I knew that this was going to happen. I was hosting people from out of town to attend this wedding. So I was already kind of, um, I, I was busy and I had no control of when this delivery was going to take place. And I knew it was going to happen when I was ultimately busy, which is say like at a giving wedding. Giving a toast. Yep. Giving a toast. And like they give, they gave me a time window, much like, um, your cable company would it just like, it'll be delivered, you know, Saturday between 2018 and 2019. So it was just, please be prepared. Um, and sure enough, they called me like in the middle of this wedding. And so I have to like go because, you know, it's not like a package where they can just leave it for you. Um, and because everything in your life is common. a half mile apart yep. from one location to another, you had to trek a full four tenths, maybe even five tenths of a mile to get to the, here. I did from well, where you were. I was at Rice University, and I had to drive back to Montrose. Okay, so one mile. Yeah, it was a tough mile. <laughs> I was because I was trying to make sure that I reached the truck, and of course, by the time like they called me, and then I came back. Or came to my house, um, and they still weren't there yet. And I waited yet like another half hour, meaning like my it the, who was getting married was a good friend of mine, and so my my absence was like noticeable. Um, and don't we think highly of ourselves? Well, <laughs> um, and so I got a call, and it was a driver who was delivering a car, mm-hmm. and. There, you know, it, this was an enclosed trailer, but it wasn't just an enclosed trailer. It was like an enclosed, double-hitched, um, like, 18-wheeler situation. It is long. It is, like, half a block long, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And so he called me and said, like, I'm in front of the CVS outside of your neighborhood and thinking that he's, oh, he pulled into the parking lot. What a, that's a really great place to try to deliver a car. And then as I'm walking out, um, he is parked in the median of Montrose Boulevard, which is like on a, it, on a Saturday night, especially a super high traffic um, street. And like it's there, cars whizzing by both sides. There's this truck blocking the median to a very popular grocery store and a convenience store um, and or is, what is, C- is CVS a convenience store? I think so. Drugstore? Drugstore? Yeah. What? What is it? It's all of those. It's, it used to be Eckerd. Used to be Eckerd's. Eckerd. Was it Eckerd or Eckerd's? Was there a... We may never know. <laughs> was there like a Bill Eckerd? Bill... Let's, let's just continue on. What was in the box? Fine. <laughs> So, um, mm-hmm. uh, it's a 1986, uh, 911 Carrera, 3.2, um, in meteor gray metallic. Um, and it came down from San Luis Obispo. Um, but anyway, so yeah, it got here like super fast. We were like, I was just telling Kevin about this. Like it got, um, I, you know, we arranged for the transaction for the car and, because it's from another city, um, there's just like some mailing of paperwork back and forth to do a thing. And then, of course, like um, completing the, the actual like, I remember I called up the dealership just to confirm, oh, do you have all the paperwork? Like, just want to make sure that you received everything. Um, and then I asked them like, oh, when would you, uh, you know, when do you think the car is going to ship out? And they said, oh, we shipped it out yesterday. <laughs> like they had shipped it out before like anything like was even finalized yet um and i think it's they conf- they probably confirmed that the car was paid for but like i hadn't signed any paperwork anything like that so i'm more than happy like as a person who is anxious and anxious and eager to get things um like that i didn't have to wait for the car like to get picked up because when i bought the cayman it took like a week before the car 
um, was picked up. And that was just like nail biting. Um, mm-hmm. it, and that was just a shipper issue. But um, anyway, so yeah, the car came and it's great. Uh, you drove it a little bit earlier. Yeah, it um, seems super solid. Yeah. And tight. Um, it's really clean. Uh, it is, it will need some things here and there as I guess they all do, but, um, I am kind of excited. I have just been like left and right buying like little bits and bobbles for it. Um, including it has sugar scoops. So I want to take care of those on the aesthetic side. There are some things, especially that I want to take care of. It did come with a Carrera tail um, that the owner added, the previous owner added, and I actually found a 2012 listing of the car where it didn't have one, um, but it came with both oh. lids, which is nice. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, so it came with the second lid. I'm gonna get that swapped out at some point in time. Uh, I'm gonna get the Euro H4s put on because scoops are questionable aesthetically. But there are people who not, are very passionate. Not much question about it. No, nope. <laughs> the scoops are bad. The scoops are bad, but there, are, there, there are enthusiasts of the scoops, as we have mentioned. They're in denial. They are in denial. They're wrong, and they're in denial. That is, I mean, like I am not gonna like we described them. They're like Steve Buscemi eyes <laughs> for 9/11s. Like they just do not look good, and they're not, not that aerodynamics like will matter like unless you're going a speed but like there's they're literally called scoops like they're nothing but like air catchers um if that is an issue of some kind in um, case anyone doesn't know what we're talking about do you think there's anyone that doesn't know i don't know yeah probably probably everybody yeah it's they the headlight the iconic 911 headlight shape which is kind of an oval actually even though mm-hmm. it looks like a circle and you know that it fits that shape and there's a little trim ring around it and for the u.s market and it's it, flush it's like it's yeah it's, it's flush it's glass flush with the you know it's like the fender and the headlight are all yeah. one and in the u.s market i guess for some reason they couldn't federalize those headlights until the late 80s so they just had this it's a sealed Seal beam. beam, just round headlight like you would get in an auto zone. And it's recessed. And it's recessed into, like, deep inside this trim piece that yeah. is that sits on the inside. So the if you can imagine, like, the 911 fender, the classic just kind of 911 fenders that stick up, like, imagine that, except that, like, these headlights are then recessed into, like, there's an overhang and a lip, basically, um, in them. So it's also weird that no matter what color the car is, the trim <laughs> ring is body color, and then the inside, inside is which like you can unpainted. see, is like beige. Yeah, I don't understand that either. Like, I maybe it's meant to be reflective or something, although it would just reflect up. I don't know. I don't understand it, but uh, I have the parts in order to convert them. Well, yes, I see. <laughs> Kevin is just given the biggest yawn I have ever seen. Well, I guess we'll move on. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just one of those days. I only got 14 hours of sleep today. Oh, ooh, getting very close here. We're sitting in swivel chairs, and I just, like, accidentally swung myself into the microphone. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's parked outside uh, currently. I didn't get a, gr- a chance to drive it much this weekend because um, of that uh, entertaining people, and it's been kind of bad weather. Um, so. But today it didn't rain for the first didn't time rain, in a while. So I did take it out. Um, for a little while. Yeah, it's gonna. That's not gonna rain for a few days. I'm gonna keep it out. I think for a few days. Good, um, good, good. Just to get a feel for it and whatnot. Get a feel for everything that is wrong with it. Mm-hmm. So, um, like say for instance, um, the brake pedals, uh, or the brake pedal, I should say, um, seems more like a suggestion to stop pedal as opposed to a stop pedal. So, I think there are some needs. Um, you and I, I like neurotically. Because uh, do you get nerdy about tires? Not, probably not like fine. You. Uh, I like I did so much research research into what kind of tires to put onto this car just because like, I mean why not? I don't know. So you recommended a tire, and then I said that sounds really good, and then I went a completely different direction. So <laughs> this is how it usually goes. Yeah, you have very nice tires in your car. You have the uh, Michelin Exaltos. 
Um, Pilot Exaltos? Or is it just Yeah, Exaltos? I think it's Pilot Exalto. Yeah, so I looked at those, and I thought about getting those... Um, and then I, mean, like, I explained to you my philosophy. I know I don't it's a want, Porsche approved. Is their recommended tire? Well, I mean, as far as that, they also recommend a Bridgestone. They recommend a Continental. They recommend a Pirelli. Uh, and I thought this is what I should try. And if I want to do something different in the future, yeah. I'll have the experience. Yeah, but wait. So you said that you did those because it was a Porsche approved thing, and you wanted to have the car as like. Porsche would have wanted you to have the car, or what, how they perceive the experience yeah, to be. Right. Um, and then, but let me ask you, mm-hmm. you've modified the car otherwise, like, um, it, which in theory would have been not necessarily how Porsche would have had the car. Rather, these are like very personalized, um, like how other people have personalized these cars too. Uh, do you think that your car now, the way that you have it, um, is like how it would have come, like the same experience that when this car came out in 1980, uh, is it the same car? Not the same car, but is it the same experience? Well, it's improved. I mean, it's different. Obviously, it's different. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, I improved the shifter. Yeah. I changed the exhaust. You could get a higher performance tire. You and gave... Then- Feeling to the 915. Right. Yeah. I mean, you see, you could get a higher performance, more modern tire and say, look, I've improved it. I just, I feel like, I feel like tires handling on this car that when I came into it, I had very little understanding of. Yeah. I wanted to experience the handling as it was meant to be. Yeah. Shifting is kind of, it. For me, shifting is like, okay, I experienced it when it was bad and yeah. I changed it to be better. Yeah. And... But the handling is a little more nuanced and complex. Yeah. The way that it handles and all kinds of experiences, you know, in all kinds of different conditions and yeah. and everything. So I wanted to have an understanding of how it was supposed to be. Sure. Um, it, which takes a longer time. I mm-hmm. feel like you could you could drive with the shifter with the stock nine fifteen for a week and say, okay, now I know how it's supposed to be. Yeah. T- handling Bad. handling could take years to kind of discover. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of you, you know what I mean. Suspension work like. Uh, from the factory, I think there is like a very certain, there's a, there is a factory experience and then there's kind of like this tuned experience, not tuned necessarily. I mean, it is tuned like one way or another, it's a tuned experience in which you're kind of dialing the car into how you would prefer the car to be. Some of it might be, I guess, factory oriented and the other would be, um, just really getting more precise into like the nuances of what you like. Like for me, like. With this car especially, I don't want it to be like, like super hard. Um, like and uh, I while I care about how like it handles, um, I also want it to be maybe just slightly softer, because I use this car. I'll use this car in the city, and I don't want it to be like rattled to death with mm-hmm. like um, like hard tires, hard suspension, like. Um, overly aggressive, basically. Um, which I mean, like, would make it like, it would really ring out like the performance aspect, I suppose. Um, but in part, like, I don't know if that's everything. What this car is about, either. And so, um, that yeah, was. Yeah, I mean, if you take, I, I think the charm of what people like about sports cars, especially '60s and '70s sports mm-hmm. cars, which these qualify. Yeah. <laughs> like there is a softness to the suspension. There is some roll yeah. there. Like, and that's part of the flaws. how it drives. Yeah. It's not a flaw. If it's, that's how it well, was yeah. designed to handle and everything. It's a flaw relative to like the technology, I guess that exists now. Cause we've all driven like more uh, modern sports cars and, uh, Maybe flaw is the wrong word, but just like when you are comparing it relative to like what's available now, um, it's just different in a very different way. And Mm -hmm. I would enjoy it in kind of that way too, kind of like in that experience of, I want to improve it in the aspects of like where they didn't, they couldn't improve on like certain discomforts and uh, certain flaws that would like otherwise kill you i would love to improve on those aspects of it um i don't want to make it a worse car though like um 
and like I have done. No, no. <laughs> Kevin, I I thought Kevin had pulled like directly in front of my house when he arrived, um, and so I called him. I said, "Oh, just go ahead and park in the driveway." Which the driveway is probably like a uh, thousand feet away uh, from the house. Two hundred. No. Yeah. Thousand. Whatever. Anyways. I thought he had parked directly in front of my house, which is like maybe 10 feet uh, to the curb. And like he said, with his exhaust, I assumed that he was very close. Um, But in fact, like it was very far away. He had gone ahead and parked in the driveway. Yes. Um, Very amusing. Very amusing. Um, Anyways. Um... So, but I like this discussion, though, of just, like, I like personalizing cars to, like, your taste. Um, it's all relative, of course, and people go through both ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between with all of this. And uh, I, I like the idea of that factory experience, too. Like, I mean, there are certain cars for me where I want, that to be the case like say for instance the celsius like for just um from i mean it's a completely different type of car obviously but like i really want that car to feel like it that why like i'm going through all of this trouble with the air suspension and they don't even make parts for it and i but i want it to be I want it to be as if it had just rolled out of the factory mm-hmm. um and there are other cars I think that I have felt that way about as well. I, the 911 maybe less so. Um, I think that I would like to tweak it to a certain extent. Um, I don't know. I think it's just one of those cars that has evolved so much, not just like in period, but rather like um, like there are so many aspects of different generations of the 911 that i enjoy that i would love to even just kind of retrofit and adapt to this car most definitely not from an aesthetic standpoint i.e like turbo twists on an impact bumper which is an unfortunately more common thing than i would like to see it really is um but um like from an everything else standpoint but anyways that all stemmed from like a tire conversation. Um, I ended up getting, uh, so I have an order, they're coming in from Tire Rack, um, Continental uh, Extreme Contact Sports. Uh, it just, there was a lot of discussion on forums and whatnot about that being a pretty good tire, um, not just for the money, but just in general. Mm-hmm. And so I'm kind of curious, I'm going to try that out. Um, and I'm hoping that it has like just enough um sidewall give because i live in a an area in which like i've described this before but it is rough uh the road so i the roads are so horrible for no reason in houston i guess because it's it's on a swamp that's fine we don't there's no snow there's no plowing there's No. no salt but the roads are worse than michigan it's because we we live in uh we live on like everything is built on clay Mm -hmm. and so it's constantly shifting and like basically once you drive on it it like you know honestly it's just kind of like it's it's like clay you like touch it and it reshapes itself and so that happens basically over time with uh our roads and we have like these expansion joints that might as well like have they're basically like us it drops like a story Mm -hmm. as you drive over them and so it's jarring, and I have memorized. This is why I don't leave the Montrose area of Houston, Kevin, is because I've memorized every flaw of the road, so I can drive around them. Because uh, they are like, I remember the first time I ever drove. I had a car with run flats. Um, I was just like la 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 driving like I normally would because I the car that I had prior to that was the Prius, and that car has like no feel whatsoever so it doesn't matter you drive over whatever you want to drive over can um, and do yeah um and i ended up like popping two tires within the first two weeks um first of all like run flats are like super stiff um and 
uh, hey, I'm really glad that I had run flats. Uh, I eventually like swapped them out because they are terrible car, uh, terrible tires. But mm-hmm. um, uh, they did save me twice within the first two weeks. Um, so there is that. Uh, so yeah, I would love just a little bit of give to them. I have had experiences with like quite a few different tire types in this area. Um, and this isn't like a purpose. This won't be for me a purpose uh, type car um, in that I'm going to be using it for whatever purposes suit the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of it will probably be taking it in and around town just for fun and then elsewhere. But I think it'll probably spend 60 to 80 percent of its town uh, time in town. So it probably needs tires that work for that. Although so these tires, softer sidewall versus... Uh, so the most direct comparison would be to um, the Pilot Super Sports, uh, which they don't make anymore for this tire size. Um, so this has uh, six and seven... But see, six these seem like tires that would have very stiff sidewalls. Um, they're stiffer than like an all-season, Okay. for sure. I thought about getting an all-season, but I thought... I, I don't want to like I that I think would be going too far in the other direction for mm-hmm. me. So and plus like it's Houston like I don't need all seasons. Um, so these I hope like they say that um, it's just like a notch under um, the performance of Pilot Super Sports, and I'm hoping that's going to translate out to like a slightly softer sidewall. So. I mean, I'm just curious where you're getting your sidewall softness. What that's comparing to, like, how does that compare to any of the Porsche recommended tires? I don't know. That's okay. the thing. I mean, like, uh, no one has, like, done, like, direct comparisons, as far as I know. And I could be very wrong on this. Like, I... Here's the thing is that, like, I, to me, sometimes I think tires are completely um, psychological especially on the non-extreme end of usage. Mm-hmm. Like, um, we, like, we'll, like, kind of momentarily drive aggressively with our cars. Like, we don't track them. Like, well, I haven't tracked any of my cars. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm never going to push the car to an extreme in which, like, I will really feel, like, where it makes a difference on the far end of things. I do care about, like, traction and grip because, like, when we do do, like, momentary stupid things like it's nice to know that you know it's not gonna like plow into like the median or something um but uh, so predictability is kind of nice so there are just like certain characteristics that from a personal standpoint i'm like kind of looking into and i i don't know like so i mean it's, it's a marginal price difference it wasn't really a price thing like i think these were 500 dollars for a set and the exaltos were 700 dollars for a set so it's not like um, a it's not like a big deal. Yeah, tires are so affordable yeah. for this size. It doesn't matter, but like my assumption, my assu- this is just like purely armchair assumption assumption assumption. That sounds really weird for some for some reason. Yeah. So you say it very weird. My my assumption will be um that it will be slightly more comfortable um, because, you know, you can read reviews all day long. You can review, uh, like you can read forum posts all day long, but unless they live in your area, drive the same roads, drive the same way that you do, like it's all, it's just going to be completely different. And unless they're on a track uh, in some sort of controlled environment, like where they can actually give you like advice that you can actually apply to your own situation. um, I'm just going to make the assumption from my, from my own standpoint that like this will have just enough, um, it'll just give me the performance that I want with just also enough give so that, um, I'm just, I don't feel uncomfortable Mm -hmm. driving the car on bad roads. So I'm good about that, like driving cars on bad roads, uh, especially in this area, but I don't know. Every time... I was driving with you in the car earlier and I was asking you like as we were going through different over different expansion joints whatnot like is that a normal noise is that a normal noise is this like am I like shattering this Fabergé egg that I've just received um and you assured me that no in fact uh you're an iPhone 11 of similar area 
is equally as rattly and shattery sounding I mean, over it's these not, expansion I points. I wouldn't describe it as rattly. It's just, it is maybe a little crashy, but I mean, the roads here are truly another level of bad. It and is. like I said, there is no excuse for it. No. They are so bad. Yeah. No, well, that's just it. And it's, nothing sounds good over it. You could no. be in a raptor, and these roads are I know. crunching it. But it's it's different, though. It, crashy is a better uh, better descriptor. Uh, going over some of these, like, bumps and uh, characteristic elements of the road. But it's that kind of, like, this car is actually, it doesn't rattle as much as I thought it might. Um, there's some, like, rattles and creaks here and there, but for the most part... Uh, like, it's just that moment where you hit, like, a an elevation change in the road where, like, it becomes, like, a slight boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, like, I'm kind of concerned, like, I don't know if that, like... Here's the thing is that, like, I'm starting to realize that this, this car, ha, at this point, in 1986, had, had been around for 20-plus years. Like, mm-hmm. they had got it down well that's the hope at least but they had got it down so like it's not going to be rattled apart necessarily um versus say for instance um did you know that there is such a thing this is i think this is just more of a forum talk type thing but in uh bmws um you get what's referred to as um explosive pothole syndrome which is where like there's this this, there's this kind of like this configuration in the stock suspension and i had this more in the um 330i that i used to have the e90 330i than i do in the wagon that i currently have but where you hit the pothole just right and it feels like the entire car like every single piece of the car is rubbing against like rattling against each other it feels like a pothole explosion did I? I think I told you about this, but when I, uh, I lived in New York, I took a job where I had to get training in Maryland. Yeah. And so I was. Oh yeah. Riding with I was riding in an X three, and we got out of the car and it was like the, you know the, the local supervisor's X three, and the X three this was the first generation X three and it had this reputation mostly from Top Gear of being like the crashiest like hardest suspension, and we got out of the car and I was like. I think your sunroof has <laughs> shattered. The oh moonroof, like the glass sunroof, yeah. had completely shattered. But it was you had like the cover, yeah, the so if you were in the cabin, you couldn't tell. Yeah. Because so when you got out, it's like, oh, the and glass it had, is gone. The glass had completely shattered everywhere, and it was in a million pieces. And we're, like, like it had just happened. We were talking about this because I'm having some like panoramic some sunroof issues, but that, like, that was an issue for many BMW models. Um, not just uh, panoramic sunroof models, the moonroof models, but like, like there is something on very select cars, not even just like generation or model, where the sunroof glass will just shatter. It was just so funny because this was like the stereotype of the X3. It was yeah. totally, it was, it was completely car. reinforced in like all of my X3 experience. Yeah, shattering roof structures will not reflect kindly on your experiences with those cars. Um, Not unlike um, our friend who had... Okay, we talked about this before, I think, but just like that this apparently is a big issue nowadays with like glass-roofed cars um, that the glass does not... I don't know if it's not... It's that it's not tested in different climates, but that seems to be the biggest factor... Um, but they still can't quite figure out exactly what's going on. Uh, but across many brands, many models, glass roofs are just shattering. It's not a, it's not an epidemic by any means, but I'm making it sound like that, but it's not an epidemic. It's just that it does happen. Mm -hmm. And it did happen to Steven's car, Mm -hmm. a friend who bought like a QX 30, which was, it's a, look it it up. We, we couldn't tell you what it is. Yeah. It's in it. it, So, but that one thing like the, so they have a QX 30, which is a, it's actually, it's an infinity version of a Mercedes GLA and it has a fixed glass roof. So it's just a panel of glass that doesn't move. And I think they thought that it might have been like a piece of glass that, or I'm sorry, a rock that like skipped over and 
uh, hit the roof. But I read a thing where it said like it would honestly have to drop from like 70 feet in the air in order to have enough momentum to shatter typical roof glass. And so more likely than not, it was more a manufacturing defect. Um, and that wow. piece of glass was like $6,000 or something like that because they don't make a lot of these things. Um, anyway, so yeah, <laughs> things. Uh, what, what, how do we even get on that? What, is, what are we talking about here? <laughs> Rat- Houston Rose rattling oh, cars Rose apart. Houston Rose rattling pothole explosion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That was my first experience with... Uh, that was the car with the run flats. Uh, and, like, those pothole explosions were, like, jarring. Because uh, it sounded like... It, and the car was solid otherwise, but whenever it hit, like, a pothole of any kind that was unreasonable it felt like the whole car was shattering apart. It doesn't happen with the wagon though. And I think it's because the E90 was on, um, it was on a sports suspension and it had bigger wheels and the wagon has kind of a waftier, like a softer suspension with smaller wheels. Uh, so it, it thuds more than it does it, than it crashes. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of glad for that. Yeah. Like it's a good city car. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. As I guess. Anyways, Kevin, mm-hmm. I've talked enough. Yeah. As <laughs> tell everyone, me about this. I know I'm getting this hand signals here. Uh, <laughs> tell us about lemons. Oh, um, I drove with our friend Steph Schrader um, in her in her 944 of Jalopnik uh, fame. Fame. Yeah. Fame. Uh, so this is the fourth race I've done with her. Um, this was the first one that was 24 hours. It was down at MSR Houston. Uh, there was like 117 cars entered, which is way too many. It has a lot of cars. It was so many. It was too many cars. I yeah. mean, I used Especially to do, for that track. I used to do track days there yeah. and like you'd have 20, 25 cars in a session and sometimes that would feel like too many. And this is like a hundred plus. So I went down on Friday. I did some laps in the car just to kind of get a feel because i've driven the car at other tracks i've never driven it here um and i felt really good i felt really confident for the race yeah um because you know it, it felt good I, like really easy to drive really comfortable yeah and i know the track pretty well and i was like oh this is great there's like maybe a dozen cars on track when i was there because it was just the test day yeah so um i stayed we like swapped the tires that night we bled the brakes we did some other things and it got super dark at six o'clock yeah um and you guys had uh you modified the car for the night driving right so steph put on steph put on headlights so it's yeah. like cool looking safari lights yeah didn't work out that well ultimately but yeah friday it got so dark just in the paddock it just got so dark oh, it was just crazy and it, and it was freezing it was super and cold because msr is not really set up even for oh my god what was in the world apologies if you could actually hear that there was a weird notification on my okay i hate that did you see what that notification was Mm-mm. it was um apple's like photos you have memories oh. do you remember this that happened last week what Anyways. was what was the, what was it showing? You? I don't know. Okay. You'd really want to know. Jesus. Anyway, so <laughs> MSR, I and I have. Uh, would you say that it was not set up well for like night races? Um, I would agree with that. Okay. They had they had put some. We'll get to the night race sure. in a minute. Okay. Um. So that was just Friday. The race started Saturday. Got there at eleven. It was supposed to. It's supposed to go, and it, it went from eleven a.m. to eleven p.m. Yeah. Um, so we got there. I ended up going second in the car. So I drove from basically one o'clock to two forty-five or something like that. So, okay. You know, or just yeah. just before one. Yeah. To for two hours. You know, we did we did the fueling hot pit. So you've got to change. You know, you got to have race suit fire suit fireproof everything and, yeah. and do the pit stop fueling on the pit road um that's another thing in the past we're not in it to win it and so in the past we've just like filled up at the gas pump because it's like okay if we lose a little bit of time yeah this is just easier but like the, there was problems with the gas pump and the pit there like 
the track was so crowded and congested that like yeah. driving that slow to the pits i mean it was just it would have been really really slow yeah um so we i think we did one stop at the gas pump and we're like okay we're just gonna do a hot pit every yeah. time but yeah. we so we did that i you know we had a, we had five people on our team i ended up driving again at 9 30 at night um a ford F- festiva caught on fire yeah um, and it took them like an hour to put it out. And so I had driven wow. for a half hour and then like I had, it burned for an the, hour. There's not even a lot of, no, 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 no. Burn. it was, it had burned for like 15 minutes and then they moved us into the hot pit and we waited while they, um, red flagged everything and they had to clean up the oil uh, and gas yeah, of course. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So after that I was like, look, I can't see anything. I'm done driving. They had kind of added. So for the track, they had kind of had like some like highway reflectors. Yeah. Like kind of on the outer edge, so you could see the track barrier, but um, I could not see anything. Our headlights were not really aligned well. Yeah, uh, it was it was dark, obviously. Yeah. Um, our and everyone else had giant LED light bars. Oh uh, yeah, and so they 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 could see advantage just LED light bars. Yeah, they could okay. see, and then it's like your eyes never adjust at all if, yeah. if there was any chance of that because in Christ. your mirrors you've got LED light bars. Is that also like blinding? Like yes. Okay. Yeah. Those LED the, light bars. The last corner on the track, like I couldn't see it at all. Yeah. I mean, the last corner onto the front straight, um, you do kind of a left right sequence. Mm-hmm. And I just, I, I couldn't see it. I almost went off the track like Whoa. every time. And then some laps, I'd be getting passed by someone with an LED light bar that was going yeah. much faster than me. Yeah. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I can, see, I'm just going to stay as close to them as I can and, yeah. and, and use their light to see where I have to go. Yeah. And it just got worse. I was like, this is not enjoyable, Oof. but, yeah. um, I was not comfortable. So, yeah. um, after the, after the, the fire and everything, I was out. Uh, I helped on a few pit stops mm-hmm. after that, and then I slept in the Prius for a little bit, <laughs> which was really comfortable. Did you did you fold down the seats flat? Um, no, I sat in the passenger seat. Okay, and put it back, and it put it lay down almost completely flat. Oh, okay. Uh, oh wow! Like I was able to pretty much sleep on my side. Yeah, and I was in a sleeping bag because it was there cold. Yeah, and then I had a blanket on top of that. It was. I was really comfortable. I did not want to get up. When I had um, a Prius, I did camp out of uh, the car, and I laid the seats flat and mm-hmm. like laid uh, head towards the hatch so that you could see up and out. And it was kind of nice because it was kind of uh, like a glass that you could look out of because it's a hatch. Uh, see, that seems uncomfortable because I would, if I wanted to sit up, I would have been impeded uh, i'm a man of <laughs> shorter stature so it was not an issue but uh, i had a bunch of stuff in the trunk yeah. i considered doing that but i had a bunch of stuff in the back okay um, yeah yeah and uh and this was really comfortable and i had a lot of room to stretch out and everything that see i was surprised at how far the seat went back it was was it cold also it was extremely cold yeah um which is why i was so bundled up anyway we had i guess i guess it was before our the car started failing because of the the, the lights, which were just giant halogen lights yeah. that didn't actually put out much light, they were very effective at killing the battery <laughs> and killing yeah. the alternator. So we had... Because it ba- was like... How, well, how many lights were there? It was four lights. Okay. And, I mean, they didn't put out much light. They Maybe they were better if they were adjusted, but... They're part... Like, they're supplemental lights. They're not, like, directional with lenses, right? Like, Or they have lenses, obviously, but they're not, like projected in any way not projectors but anyways i'm just imagining in my head like that they are more like they're supplemental lights more than they're meant to be uh primary lights uh yeah i don't know which is no, either way like especially if they're halogen i imagine that would kill like a an old car's electrical system pretty fast yeah it did that yeah <laughs> um so we struggled the rest of the time with battery issues luckily i Never really ran into it, but um, yeah, yeah. The driver after me at night, she came in two or three times to adjust the headlights, and then the last, and then after that, they dimmed to the point of nothing, and the car died. Uh, and so it came in the pits, and we changed the alternator, or I didn't. I 
was useless, but uh, <laughs> I watched, and then I went to sleep. You stood by the side watching them as you ate a Fig Newton. Yeah, so yeah. I went back in the car at like 7.15. I got up at, before that, but I woke. I went in the car at 7.15. It was daylight, thankfully. I drove for nearly two hours. Um, it's just a lot of cars out there. Yeah. I had some clean running. We had fewer cautions during that period. My, yeah. my first session, I had... There was a big collision where like two cars went into the wall. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. Everyone was okay, but it took a while to clean up. And was everything. that at night or during in the, the day? day? The first okay. session was in the day. So okay. I ended up doing like five and a half hours or five hours in the car Oof. racing, which Man. was cool. I mean, yeah. it was, I mean, as far as track time, that's really valuable. Yeah. Track time. Um, it was. I don't know. So I'll, I'll skip ahead and then get to my thoughts. But we f- we ended up finishing. I did the second to last stint. Um, and then after I got out of the car, it wouldn't start for oh, the next driver. No. So we had to like push start it. Yeah. We were going to push it. We were going to push it out of the pits. Yeah. Because we were on the hot pit changing. Yeah. And we were going to push it into the paddock. Oof. But it started. Yeah. So she just drove and like went onto the. Whoa. Uh, so she just went onto the track. Okay. So it was great. It actually worked out great. But. Um, I think after that there was. I think they changed the battery. She had. To, she broke down again. She had to come in and change the battery. Yeah. So I was never really faced with these issues, but um, <laughs> somebody else. The did. car. Yeah, the car had some problems from. Yeah. All. All from the lights. Yeah. Um, and this was in the daytime, but it was Man. just the damage had been done. Do you think what would have been a more ideal lighting situation for this kind of race? Do you think? LED light bars. LEDs. It, less way. strain on the car yeah. and. Yeah. More light. Do you think LED light bars or like just even LED headlights? But I guess I the mean, light bar is just light up the whole road. So Yeah, I mean, any of it. Any combination of it. Or, I, yeah. If you could have he- LEDs in where the headlight sockets are and have an LED light bar, like so, that would be great. You can't have you, too much light. I've only ever like kind of observed night racing, but like if you're actually in it, in the middle of it, like that seems like... You know, everyone has their own lighting situation. They're just trying to see as much of the road as possible. But at the same time, like, I can only imagine that you have, like, all these lights behind you that are just, mm-hmm. like, blazingly bright. Um, how do you how do you deal with that? Like, how do you process, like, because, I, I mean, it's not that you have, like, I you have these mirrors blinding you, I guess. But, like, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of... I mean, I, I wouldn't know how to tell you because I really struggled with it because okay. I really struggled where there was times where I just couldn't see and some of that was because there's like a blinding white light in your mirror and it just totally dims whatever light you do have yeah. in front of you. So that's, just, uh, that's what I'm wondering is that like, is there a, you know, because normally like, you know, your lights light up your path, but now you have like a bunch of other cars not lighting their own paths, but uh, they're overly bright for their situation, and then combine but, it with everybody I mean, else. You, this, it only affects you when you see it in the mirror. It's, yeah, you don't really get the benefit of. I, I didn't really get the benefit of someone behind me and their lights Light illuminating the road yeah, for yeah. me. Like I didn't really have that. Well, Usually they got around me really fast because yeah. I couldn't see, so I was going slow. Yeah. So really, it was just like a bad situation from, from a mirror situation where, like, yeah. Yeah, it would disorient. Um, and because I couldn't see, I had to go really slow. And yeah. then it's like you have cars just... So, I mean, there were people... I think there's people that had done the night driving before yeah. and were prepared and had a good light set up. And yeah. then it's like... I mean, there was people driving like it was daytime, Okay, which is crazy. So can I ask you, do you think that Lemons is getting too serious? Um, because I think you could have asked that ten years ago, and people would have said yes. Here's the thing. Okay. Here's two things. Go on. Like I went to, uh, I went to Lemons. I started racing. I've done it since like 2014. Yeah. And then I've been to. I went to a race in like 2011 at Houston. Yeah. And it's funny because I went to the one in Houston in 2011. Yeah. And I saw cars that were still there, like yeah. some cars then that are there today. And yeah. It's like they've gotten years of development. So there's. There's there, people that are really fast. I don't think that's the problem. I think, but I think having a hundred and a hundred plus cars on a track is too much. Sure. And so when it comes down to for me, 
And if you're in if you're in a class A car and you're really fast and you have yeah. your shit together, and you win against a hundred car grid, like I guess that's a unique challenge and a unique bragging rights, and that's like you are the best of the best. To me, what I enjoy about Lemons, because it's the cheapest way to go wheel to wheel racing, and wheel to wheel racing is very different from doing a, a track day. Uh, so, <laughs> wow, we've got a real crisis here. Um, anyway, so it's a cheaper way to go wheel to wheel racing, which is which is cool. I don't know if I get a lot out of going into a race with 117 cars. The enjoyable thing for me is. Yes, there's always going to be people faster than you. Yes, there's people that just blow past you. But you do find your battles. You pick your battles. You find your battles. You find people that are comparable speed to you. And you, you know, you race with them for a few laps. And you either pass them or you, you lose sight of them. But, you, you know, there's the chance of setting up that pass, making something stick, and having good battles. And you don't really get that when you find someone that's a good match and then you approach, you know, you have 12 faster cars passing you in one corner or, or you come across six cars that are slower than you all in, you know, yeah. in your, in your four wide, like it's, it's a different thing. It requires skill, but it does feel more like a freeway than racing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's for me. Yeah. But, I didn't enjoy this many cars and it was just like the, the things of enjoyment that I get from this were very few and far between. Even when I had a two hour session of clean running and it's like, yeah, there's some, a couple good moments, but it was mostly just letting a bunch of people by and then navigating around much, much slower cars and, and uh, there's just a lot of cars all at once and you will find yourself in a pack of 12 cars going through the corners and it's like well, we're not really taking the racing line we're not really racing we're just sort of suffering through this until it spreads out a little bit what do you think uh, so why would so in this particular particular situation why would they have why do you think they let so many cars in her like I feel like it's Maybe beyond the, that's beyond the limitations of the track or the event, but like there seems to be kind of like an ideal situation in which like it would be safer even because if with that many cars it seems kind of less safe. Yeah, definitely. Um, um I I I think I think that's beyond the limit of the track. I think the organization takes safety very seriously, and they, that's why they take it seriously as far course. as the car and the safety stuff. So that you can have these chaotic situations on track and people are not r really in danger or rel it's relatively safe for, for such chaos. They, because they take roll bars and everything so seriously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I, I don't know the motivation. I mean, I know that they can... It's, it's cynical to say, yes, they can catch a check for every car that enters. And I think that is a, a thing. Um... I don't know what sure. the solution is. Yeah. It does seem like fewer cars would be better, but people seem to enjoy it no matter what. It's just, it's a different thing. It's a different thing from, you know, real endurance racing. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of controlled chaos and it's like a circus. Mm -hmm. And, and that's kind of the stereotype. And I think they kind of like that. Yeah. I, the events I've done before with lemons, uh, were smaller and I've done chump car. Uh, it wasn't like this last year, right? Because this is the first 24 hour, one in like five uh, years yeah okay they did so, it 24 hours a couple of years ago okay uh because last year was different also you i did it last year and there's probably just as many cars but i was in a volkswagen that you were was in a type three right it was garbage and yeah. it was so slow and i was just letting people by and trying to drive defensively <laughs> the scary that thing is like a really terrifying car like what 50 horsepower uh, well, and we couldn't even use all the 50 horsepower because it would overheat. So we were driving, literally oh we were driving, God. instead of looking at the tack, you were looking at the temp gauge. And so we pretty much couldn't go beyond like 40 miles an hour. Oh, man. And so the thing about that was, and this sounds easy, but you would be surprised that it's not. You're yeah. letting every single person pass you. Yeah. But like, you don't want to be in a situation where you're on the straightaway 
and someone and you're in the middle Ooh. and someone is passing you on either side yeah. because then you like have no out. Yeah. And it was funny because in the 944 this year, I was, I would sometimes be in the reverse situation where yeah. like a lot of people approach a much slower car at once. And it's like, yeah. Hopefully, like, the fastest car, you can force the fastest car to take the middle. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I'll be on the right. The really, really slow car will be on the left. And it's like, you tell that fast car. I mean, you're saying, like, yeah, if you want this, you got to go, yeah. in the, you know, in the middle. And kind of where you're kind of, you're taking a lot of uh, agency sure, away. Sure. You know, you're, you're losing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but people will do it. And people will do things that are not sensible or you will see yeah. people not looking that far ahead. That's yeah. the thing. Like that's the one thing is you try to look, yeah, far, look ahead, far ahead and you would see people not exactly doing that. Yeah. Um, and then you're being surprised by things and yeah. you would watch the moment when they realize, but overall it was fun. We finished the car finished despite the battery and alternator issues. We finished like 52nd out of all those cars. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it was so much work to finish 52nd. Like yeah. we had relatively good reliability. Yeah. We had no black flags. We had no accidents. We had no spins. Um, a friend of the show, Will Pierce, came out actually on Saturday yeah. and Sunday yeah. to spectate. He's, he saw like into the evening and um, we were just commenting on some of the cars and stuff. And yeah. it's like he made a good point that like the the early 80, 80s 300ZX, yeah. it's like, you know, it was pretty ridicule like overweight like not that good car it's like when you when you strip it out when you take out all this like garbage emission stuff and then yeah. strip out the car it's, it's a good pretty car. potent car yeah. you know and yeah. i think a lot of people have found that to be the case yeah um and that's like one of those cars that's like perfect for it it's, you know you buy it cheap yeah you run it and it's when and it's, it's quick and it's yeah. probably pretty reliable yeah I would love to, I, this, I, I wanted to go last year. I didn't. I didn't want to go this year, but I didn't. But one day I will come and I will support you. Oh, thanks a lot. I'll, I have a foamed finger <laughs> <laughs> to support you, Kevin. Uh, one of these I'm picturing like Mr. Burns when he's like, send this back. Get me one that's more normal size. Less ludicrously sized. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. Reasonably sized. My yeah. excitement must be appropriate no uh, and i will say like i've done track days and the f- feel of wheel to wheel racing is very different and very cool and, mm-hmm. and you can't that's pretty unattainable in yeah. normal circumstances so it is really cool what the series has done to deliver that experience yeah. to more people um for sure just you know with track days you can only pass in the straightaways you only pass with point buys like this it's you know it's yeah. it's it's something else yeah. And that is cool. That is cool. But, uh, yeah, I think, so we, we finished, um, I guess that was it, but it was, it was good. All you could want. It was fun. Just to finish. Uh. It was a cool experience to do a 24 hour race. Yeah. Um, the whole night, a lot of, a lot of times they do like, you know, 10 hours Saturday, eight hours Sunday and that's, yeah. and that's the weekend and that's still cool. And I would probably prefer that from now on because I hate night driving. And, there were some interesting cars that were entered. Uh, you saw that Saab 9000. Yeah. It was pretty cool. They had... their their The team was called Saabs of Anarchy. Oh. And their flag... Like, they had flags flying over their pit, and it was, like, the Swedish flag and the yeah. Anarchy symbol flag. <laughs> <laughs> and did I tell you, these guys were from Connecticut, and they had no, Connecticut that played make, on the car? What, that makes sense as hell. That yeah, yeah, well, came I, Connecticut. I thought that it was the joke. I thought the Connecticut plate was a joke. And they're like, no, we're just from Connecticut. <laughs> And they I were... told them they needed like dentist office magazines on the <laughs> on the back deck, like the rear window deck. Well, first of all, like actually, maybe a nine thousand is very Connecticut appropriate. Um, uh, I would hope that at one point, or at some point, someone will enter a, a nine hundred, but a nine thousand is appropriate for that. Um, but it's a five hundred dollar limit, not a one hundred dollar limit. Do you know if it was a four cylinder or a six cylinder? I have pictures. Okay. I took a picture of it. Send it to me and Blake. Me. We'll no. like uh, analyze. Oh, God. And tell you because it doesn't matter either way. But mm. um, that it survived an entire race is amazing in and of itself. It won the class. Yeah. It won B class. That's astonishing. I would test for cheating. I somehow. think it was like sixth or seventh. With a sixth or seventh overall. Okay. 
Wow. Um, should we in our own team with a? I would love to get a sob. What no. if we get? Uh, let's just do it. Fine. Okay. We'll have to get an NG nine hundred though, new generation nine hundred, not a classic sob, mm-hmm. but a Geon Epsilon platform sob. Do you have any literature? Do we have no time? No, for we this? have no literature. You didn't bring anything, did you? Yeah, I did. Wow. I'm like looking around. I don't know. I have, as if this were like a Christmas party in which I forgot to give you your secret Santa. Oh, I have this ikea catalog which has a car it's a volvo oh uh ooh. why did i ask just take out your thing just uh, take it out take out your thing show it to me <laughs> <laughs> all right all right this is a ooh. bmw m family brochure from i think 2001 oh an odd year yeah, really odd. Because this was their M lineup. Yeah, also, like, wow. Like, uh, how also appropriate for production values um, that the M line, which you think would be flagship, is this saddle-stitched, uh, high-gloss brochure. Because I think in the other ones, they use a... They do a perfect coded, bind. It's a perfect bind coded map. I think because I think this was just under the threshold of pages, because I have other ones from the era, and I think there are more pages in this one. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I I that's I don't know. I think this was like ninety nine. I think this was the year before the M five came out. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So it's only, uh, the E thirty six M three. Yeah. Coupe. Yeah, it had it been so that would have been ninety nine. Coupe and convertible. Okay. Uh, oh, so there was no M3 sedan. No, so ninety nine was the uh, M3 sedan like ninety seven and ninety eight or what? Uh, I don't know. That I don't know. Uh, and then this was also the Z3 and Z3 M coupe. Ooh, look at that. Oh, that's that nice. color. It's like the green. So we're looking at a Z3 M convertible Roadster. That looks good. That looks really good. That is such a cool color. It does have the bad wheel. It's the, a very bad wheel. Yeah, the bad wheel that um, Daniel Sloan hates because he has that in his um, 740i. Oh, uh, I didn't know those see. wheels uh, existed in that era. Like, I thought those I thought are they the, were only the only three liter. Yeah. Didn't you? Uh, I thought so too, but maybe not. Or maybe it's an old <laughs> press photo, but it's the. <laughs> I don't know, there's like a hundred <laughs> steps on the automatic <laughs> transmission. We're we're looking at um, a photo of the. Uh, it's not even Steptronic at that point, right? Because it's it doesn't have like a manual mode. It's the automatic M. It's the automatic transmission, and it's actually it's the same in the um, what the regular what the E36. Those, like, wait, what the hell were these arrow? Those are one is closed. It's solid. Solid means closed for the window, and it's not all of those. Hollow. Yeah, duh. <sighs> Okay, but first of all, um, what Kevin was referring to earlier, the 100 steps, was the, like, shroud that covers the shifter, because it, it's not a gated shifter, it's just, like, a straight up and down shifter, and it has, like, this stepped, um, you know, like, at an airport baggage claim? <laughs> the conveyor? The con- like yeah, the it's convey- like a little like plastic the... conveyor, like, stepped thing. Yeah. yeah, where it turns. Anyway, so, BMW... Models had that at some point in the nineties. I love this. Ooh, Dakar yellow. I love Dakar yellow. Look at that, and it has the good wheels too. And it's got the good the wheels and wheels. no spoiler. Ooh, I would have that all day. Oh, and black interior. It looks really good. It looks really good. I saw one like this at Coda a couple weeks ago, and it was automatic. I have no room or effort for having any other car- any other cars, but if I could find like an E thirty six M three in Dakar yellow sedan, preferably, but if Ooh. not. I would totally get I one. Th- I think look. I love cool. the M3 E36 sedan, and I love Dakar Yellow. I don't know if I would love a sedan in Dakar Yellow. Really? I feel like the the Dakar Yellow needs to be a coupe. Maybe. You think the sedan needs to be a subdued thing? Like it's a sleeper situation? Yeah, I think like ultraviolet. Uh, oh, yeah. 
Ah, okay. Ultraviolet would be cool as hell, yeah. That's what they call it, right? No, Technoviolet? Technoviolet. Technoviolet. Because okay. we saw the, the, the two at that mm-hmm. one dealership one time. Look at how blurry this photo is. Like, look Ooh. at that this, this, like, can make the cut. Yeah. Do you think that that photo maybe was even Photoshopped, early Photoshopped? days situation or did someone what to make it to make it blurry i think it was just shot poorly and they're like well this is what we got probably um yeah lots of good helvetica good photos this does have the feeling of being like just cobbled together from like five different brochures yeah which i'm sure it was yeah definitely um but yes Ooh, see that's that's my dream. Ooh, that does look good. Yeah. Dakar yellow. Coop looks good. Coop. Coop looks good. Estrel blue. I know. All right, let's skip to the end here. Hey, there's Stelvio Pass Ooh, pictured. Yeah. See, I probably saw that before I ever knew what Stelvio Pass yeah. was. What else we got here? Oh, that's colors. a lot of colors. A lot of colors. For a special edition car. Boston or green. Or a special car. Ah. <sighs> You can tell it's because it's racist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Boston, Boston green is good, except that it was always paired with like flesh beige interior. Or like, white, like the light guy, super light gray. Yeah, the light gray is fine. I'm sure it was fine when it was new. Of course, it doesn't age well. Basically, on an old car, you should hope that you get a black interior. Ooh, I remember the you smell just of the sniffing. What are you yeah. sniffing? You, the, you just sniffed the at this. The BMW brochures had a smell. That's ink. Yeah, but yeah. they had their own. That's carcinogenic 90s ink. Yeah. Not like the healthy ink that we have now. No. <laughs> yeah. You've been impressed, Jax. That's what, uh, that's what a, that's what a um, printer smells like. Could you get Imola Red on an E36 M3? I don't know. I've That's never ever seen it, so I would say no. Hey, but that would be what cool. if we did one thing right now that was just so annoying that we should just do it? Mm. Let's call Daniel Sloan. Let's put him on speakerphone and ask him that question right now. Okay. All right, we're doing it. We're patching it in. We're calling our friend Daniel Sloan in Portland, Oregon, who is a BMW enthusiast and knowledgeable expert of sort. It's ringing. All right. He probably thinks it's an emergency because I hope he answers. Which side's the speaker? It's hard to say. Okay. Oh, my God. What could he have to do on a Tuesday night? Daniel? <laughs> Daniel, yeah. it's Kevin. Um, and, I know, hi. And Chris. Oh, no, and are you Skyping me into your podcast? I yes. Well, not, not quite Skype. We're just holding the phone up to the mic. Yeah. Kevin, speak gentler. Oh, no. <laughs> we have an emergency <laughs> question to ask Kevin, you. This is Kashmir. <laughs> okay. Chris is spilling a drink for the fifth time. Um... Was the E36 M3 available in Imola Red? Um, it might have been hell rot instead. I think it was a little bit of a lighter red. At least the the ones that um, I've seen the most in the U.S. Okay, but have you ever seen Imola Red on an E36? Not, not to my knowledge on an Right. But definitely on an E46 M3 yes. M39 M5. Yeah. But I, I mean, up until like a couple weeks ago, I didn't think the E46 M3 came in Estoril oh. in the US. Yeah. But apparently there were a handful of them. Okay. Wow. So yeah. That's what amazing. Do I know? Hmm. Well, we called the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> you wasted our but time. I, I just, I Yeah, well, it was on. Okay, so we're looking at we're looking at the literature section of the show, and yep. we're looking at a. I would say it's a 1999. It doesn't really say the year. Actually, it probably does. It's a. Find the year. It's it's it. like a. 
it's I think it's the year before the E thirty nine M five came out. I think it's a ninety nine motorsports brochure and it's just Z three and M three. It's like Z three M Coupe and Roadster and M three. And so it shows the colors in the back for all of them. And it does have Imola Red, which I know came on the Z the Z three M yeah. Coupe and Roadster. Definitely yeah. That one. Definitely both of those came in Imola. Yeah. So I wasn't sure if that was just like a color across the board th- or what. Okay. Uh, conversely, have you ever seen it? I think we've seen it. Z three M's in Dakar Yellow. Have you seen that? Yes. Okay. Okay, Daniel. Pre M Contour, what year would that have been? This does not have M Contours. No. Pre M Contour. Yeah. Like, that those were those were on the E thirty six M three in like ninety six. Yeah. There's not one Maybe M Contour picture. Okay, but this this is post M Contours then. This isn't. Yeah. I don't see them in this brochure at because all. Because the it is post. Whoa. Okay, then yeah, maybe they have the old photos. Being <laughs> what? This, you're being recorded. Yeah. You're you're alive. You're hot. the mic is hot. Yeah, this is good audio. It's funny cuz I I'm actually drinking whiskey right now. Oh my god, so wow. are we. <laughs> what are the odds? And I'm playing Imola Red Dead Redemption. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Oh my god. Okay, well we're done wasting your time. We'll yeah. let you go. Have a good night, Daniel. Right. Thanks for answering. Yeah. Goodbye, Daniel. You're, you're welcome. All right. Enjoy the show. Bye. All right. Bye. <laughs> well, that answered nothing. Um, <laughs> We're going to cut that out. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, since this isn't a factual-based show, mm-hmm. nothing matters. So no. we'll just say that yes, no, yes, yes, no. Whatever it was, the question. I don't even remember. I don't either. Uh, yeah. Are we at the four hour mark already? We're at like an hour and a half. Okay. That's a long podcast. Yeah. I think we should give them reprieve. Yeah. People who have stuck, person who have stuck long, long enough for mm-hmm. this. Anyways, um, we're going to call this a podcast. So thank you for listening. <laughs> we're going to shave this off. So it's probably not going to be an hour and a half. It's going to be, we're going to whittle it down to useful content. So it's going to be about 10 minutes. Yeah. So thank you for listening for the last ten minutes, Kevin. Wheel us out. Well, wheelbarrow us out of this situation. Oh, yes, if you're on the Instagram, you can see some of the things we've talked about at New for ninety six. Mm, amazing. Do we have a Gmail? Should we Gmail? We have a Gmail. All it's right. New for ninety six spelled out with an. N and letters. Gmail and spelled out. I guess everything else too. Yeah. <laughs> the rest all of good. It. That's, That's it. all going to go to like someone else's email. Yep. Thank you for listening. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.